ever fretted before? I'm talking about guitar. <laughs> okay. Who here has, who here knows or doesn't know what compression fretting is? Okay. Okay, okay compression fretting was used in the old days for an adjustable truss rod. We're all familiar with the adjustable truss rods. You know, you can make it the next back and forth. So in the old days, if you look close here, see that piece of paper? They were put on the factory. In the old days, they had a little paper and a handle glued on here, and they'd break them off, and that was the rest of it. But if you look in here, there's a little, and you can come up and take a look at this. There's actually a piece of cold cold steel in here in the shape of a T. Yeah, so if anybody wants to come up and look at it, you'll see that. That is the truss rod. Uh, I can't remember exactly when they started using them, but they started first with ebony, then they went with uh, this T-bar, and from what I understand, it was actually a sled runner. Those are the first ones that they used, and then they got that uh, the T-bar made. And then they went to a square tube, back to the ebony, then they went to adjustable in the mid-80s, I think it was. So in order to adjust neck relief, you have a given fret slot. Okay. So you have a fret slot, usually about 0.020. Okay. So in order to create a back bow in the neck, they would put a tang in here that was greater than the 020. This will push the neck back. The there is no one scenario for every truss rod compression fret. It, it's, it's an art. So, the easiest way to do this is to break the neck up into two parts. We don't do nothing to that. Because that goes over the guitar. And if you use the heavy fret wire on there, hey, Mark, yeah. oh, he's going to grave me. <laughs> All troublemakers to the front. <laughs> That's Mr. DePearl. Anyway, this goes over the guitar, so I'm not really worried about what's going to happen here. All right? Here, is the second part I'm most worried about from about here up. Because here I have this big mass of the heel. Here is where I'm going to get the neck to do the adjustment. So, how would you fix this? The trick is to understand that you're going to actually wedge it. So keep it simple. Really, don't overthink it. Now there's one thing, one piece of equipment I didn't bring in that is glue. I don't I, I suggest strongly, don't use super glue for this procedure. Hot high glue, fish glue, pipe bomb. Those are my three glues that I will use. The glue is not going to stick the fret into the slot. It's going to work as a lubricant. So, in order to get this process started, the first thing you have to do is prep your fingerboard. Now, I've already done that, so I've leveled this. And these are the tools that I use. If you want to come up and take a look at what I'm using, uh, I have three different fret tang sizes. Does everybody know what a tang is? All right. A tang also has a barb on it. It has a crown. And if you look at this under a microscope, that's your tang. There's a barb here. You have a crown. In the machining process, you do not get a dead square corner. So in reality, it comes up here and it does a slight raise. All right? So your fretboard is going to want to come in here. So if you don't plan for that now, you're going to have a hard time getting the fret to sit down. So you either use a triangular file, and these are my favorite file, files. They're called a pillar file, P-I-L-L-A-R. And what really makes these nice is you have a working, you know, I can find my nails, and that school, there's nothing there. Put a black mark now, put cat whiskers on. So I really like these. Uh, I know people like triangular files. Use what works for you, whatever seems to fit your, your modus operandi. Where do you get those from, John? Uh, I buy these, any tool industrial, uh, MSC, Master Farm, uh, WW Ranger, you know, and they also are pretty straight. I mean, they have a very, very reasonable straight edge, so for a rough and straight edge, they also work. They also are terrific for dressing the ends, filing the nails, 
you know, they work really good. They're very, very smooth cut. So they're actually a, almost a finishing file. And I, I learned about these as my job as a tool maker. What do you call them again, John? Huh? What do you call them again? Pillar. P-I-L-L-A-R. Pillar file. And they're, you know, you buy a box so that you have a lifetime supply. But they, they are really great. The, the uh, source again, you said, John? Was where? The source again? Uh, any industrial, WW Granger, Master Car, uh, MSC. They're, they're, they're readily available. Uh, Nicholson. What's the other file company? Norton. So, you know, you can find them. They, they come in two different cuts. Uh, this one's a number four, and this one is, gosh, my eyes don't work. This is that size. All right. <laughs> now, one, I did forget my magnet fuels. I'm of the age where, uh, you forget what kind of Yeah. They're a son of a bugger when you go outside and the sun's hot. <laughs> okay, now, now that I have the board, we're going to assume that everybody knows how to level a fretboard. Is there anybody here that doesn't know how to level a fretboard? Great. Well, how, how do you level the fretboard if you're trying to put some kind of a compound radius on it? This is my belt sander. <coughs> Chalk. And then when it's reasonably done, I'll actually take a long, this is a, what they, it's actually a machinist parallel. I got paid to make these when they fired me, I brought them home. And then I can put like 600 grit on here, and then I, I basically will go along the line of the string. You do it the same way, Pat? Uh, pretty much, yeah. yeah. I'm not worried about the total arc itself, I'm worried about the lines of the string. And anybody wants to have a question, yell and scream. I'm working on my first few Mac. I could assume that that came level on the fretboard. Never assume. No, it did that, not. That, that stuff wasn't. No, uh, and this has to do with any fret job. And I, I think anybody who's built guitars know. Fretting, the final end result is all about fret. I've already put the frets on. Okay. The and and that, that sawtooth stew Mac, yeah. I yeah. hate that. Because that doesn't really matter. You worry about the fret plane. And we'll get into leveling the frets later, which you'll really be interested in. Yeah, that's I just want to say, well, it's, he was talking about uh, compound radius. Yes. And what I, I know what I do on that, mm -hmm. you know, for, for straight radius, I'll do what you were saying, go along the line of the strings. Mm -hmm. For compound radius, I go along the line of the edges of the fingerboard. Right. And that way it starts out at a, at a small radius and then it flattens out. Some well, old way. Martins, when they were done by hand, when, when they would prep the board, they'd go over to a belt sander and they would just rock the fretboard on here. And what would happen when you rock it, it's riding this radius and this radius and it would actually so come down the radius. It was okay. done accidentally. Okay, yeah. Now you can also invest in compound radius jigs. I played a lot of guitars. I didn't know if they were compound radius or not. Come on in. So we covered frets, slots, tangs, lights here. <laughs> That's good, yeah. All right. Okay, now the next thing I'm going to do is press the slot. And if it's not a major thing, a triangular file or a safe edge file, and all I'm going to do is break that corner. And that's going to do two things for you in the end result. When you've got a pull of fret, it gives a point of relief so the bar won't tear out as much. Uh, who here has never done a refret? Okay. Uh, at some point, you're going to have some fret wear, and you're going to have to remove a fret. Uh, the trouble with super glue, who here has done a refret with super glue involved? <laughs> How many want to say it's a PIA? PIA. Worse than that. Pain in ass. Not that bad. Uh, <laughs> Eat the fret. They, they can, but they, they can be sometimes they, they can. They actually ship less. Uh, well, you got to heat them. You got to heat them. Oh, and that I helps. Glue you're gonna eat. I, I think the super glue ones ship less because the super glue is hardened up the end grain. Well, that's why that's why I like the hot glue and the fish glue because it, it permeates the end grain. Sometimes super glue can be a problem, but. 
But well, what I like about well, the reason why I don't like the super glue is I'm using the glue as the lubricant. Yes. Now, granted, I came over here and forgot the glue, so in substitute use water. But the, the glue is actually going to work as a filler. Now, super glue will get in there. I've had some issues with some super glue, and it might might be the brand of super glue. What super glue do you use? Smith. I'm using Starbucks. The stuff that you get is the, every hobby shop that they put the name of the hobby shop on. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, like Smith will put anybody's name on it to buy so many cards. Yeah, I buy, I buy it by the court. Real I thin stuff. I've been using Starbucks, and that, that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. It's great for sticking. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I fixed that one. I like to use, uh, like I said, my preference is for fish glue, type bond, a water based yeah. glue. Yeah. But, you know, that's my preference, and just because I said so, don't mean it's true. John, if you're using fish glue, and you're, I mean, it takes a long time for that fish glue to set up and hold that fret, so I mean... Well, it's not holding the fret. Okay. You're using it lubricant. You're using it as a glue, then it's wet as a lubricant. Mm -hmm. uh, and today I'm going to use water because I walked over here and forgot my fish glue. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll actually put water in, and I can, I forgot to tell you, clean your fret slots and get all the gunk out of them. Okay, so I usually put a little water and then I work the fish glue in, wipe it off, and I hammer my thread. I have a question, Friday. How much effect does the water make? Very little. Very little. When, when you wet wood, it goes across the grain, not like what? Okay, so now I'm all ready to start. <coughs> I just use my fingernail and, and work the water in it. Okay? That's all I do. But I don't start at number one. Well, I should say, who start at number one? I'm going to start with like a 19 and a half or a 20 fret tang at number one, because that's just a measuring point. All right? This is your process for fretting, not specifically compression fretting. fretting well, fretting and compression fretting are, 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 are related. Compression fretting is going to be using different size fret tangs. Fretting is going to use, oh, you know, like 19, 5, 20. So I'm going to start with a 20 and a half fret wire. All right? Then I take my favorite hand. Who presses and who hammers? I'm a hammer guy. And these hammers are actually called the cobbler's chasing hammer. And I just love them. I find them at all the antique shops. So what I'm going to do when I start is I just take that edge, tap it right there, and then I do that. Okay, I'm good. Now normally it didn't didn't disappear in all the wood chests. No, it didn't. No. And then just come across. This is a, a dice. And I, I sharpen that on a top sand. When you buy these they have like a, a V point like this. I just take a belt saying and grind that off and make it a chisel point because I can actually nip that off pretty close to the fret, right to the end. Okay? Double check. And that's reasonably close. That, one, that one's bouncing a little bit, so we have to probably have to super glue and and touch it because I will use super glue to close up the end. Okay, now to start the actual compression threading, I like to start right down here around 10, 7, and 4. John, lay your straight edge on there. <coughs> you are you're parallel right now. I'm dead flat. Okay. Yep, see, so I, that way we can see yeah. I should have done how Thank much you. we're pushing it back. Okay, the goal. <laughs> is to get somewhere about seven to nine thousandths of a backbone from the seventh fret to the first fret. What I like to do when I actually put this on the guitar before I, when I final dress is I'll actually block this up and I want to put about 10 to 12 pounds on the guitar so I can actually spring the neck a little bit. And I want to try to level it not 
at full spring load, near spring load. Because when I'm done, I want to have about four to eight thousandths relief. And what I did find when you compression fret, you're going to find that these move for probably a week to those barbs finally totally set in. Because they, they do bite in the end grain. Uh, there is no, it's not smooth. So I'm going to start with, I did the 20. Now I'm going to start with the 23 5. I'm going to start pushing my neck. John, where do you get the, 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 this fret wire with all the different tanks? Uh, Blues Creek Guitars. But if you want to do, if you want to, I mean, I said, where do you get it? If you want to buy it by the pound, Jess Clark. Okay. Okay. I mean, they'll sell it to you by the pound. So, and trust me, that's a lot. Of, that lot of that is a lot of wire. So, like, get your 19 and 20 that you use normally, and then if you just need a, in fact, you know, this, like, eight, I charge eight bucks a wrap, and trust me, that will do a lot. Would you now. say a wire by the pound? Uh, if you buy it by the pound from Jess Clark, you're going to pay probably about 45, 50 bucks. Okay, what's the name of the place? J E S C A R. Jess Clark. Com. Okay, so I'm just going to check, put threads in these three positions. And i got to remember which one's that. Remind me, that's 20. You said you started with 20 and a half. I started, the 20 and a half was the first one, because that's the neutral wire. Now I want to work, I want to work my slot. You can actually buy fret wire up to about a 27 pound, a 27 tank. But that is really a, you're at the point of replacing the fretboard, don't you agree, Pat? Well, sometimes if somebody did a really bad partial fret job, maybe the first three frets are yeah. really opened up, then I'll go with a 27 or a 28 and save the board. And if I'm doing anything different than you or anybody else who's done this, don't be afraid to speak up because there's more than one way to do this. Hey, John, just to back up the bus a little bit, now you said that you... You're, you're loading the top of the guitar with 10 to 12 pounds to kind of simulate neck tension. Did you say you're leveling the fingerboard at that point in time? The fret plane. At yeah. that point, I'm going to level fret. Oh, this okay. is after it's installed. This right. Is, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, what, what was the time you were uh, right, now, right now, I'm using a gravity checker. 23 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I used 23 and a half to start. Uh, I didn't bring any, any of the heavier stuff because this is the first time this one's been refretted, so I know I can get away with it. But you do need a, a nice selection of tang wire. So you've done frets one, seven, and. Yeah, you're going to just, don't worry about the exact position, but figure between three and the heel. Let's say this was a 12 fret. Uh -huh. uh, if you do about the same way, come off the heel and pick about three. I'm thinking two to ten is the area that has the most effect exactly. on the curvature of the neck. So I'll bang those those in first, check the neck. Okay, so and then I'll worry about the one or the above. Yeah. Well, I put the one in. It's a good test. Just yeah, to get well, a test I do this so I can measure, but everybody has their own technique. I don't like the gauges that measure the fretboard. I want to measure the fret. Do you agree with that? Uh, are you talking about the straightness of the neck as yeah. it's being done? Yeah. I like to check the board. Yeah. The dial indicators. Well, I do the board with... I want to see the effect that I'm having. Right. Well, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to sight. I've done enough of these that I can pretty much eyeball. And he's right, you know, measure the first couple. But you have to see a bit of, of movement. So this is telling me if I have to use more bit larger frets or I can go to a smaller fret. And I don't want to get, you got to be careful how the neck moves, how about it? I mean, you can get one neck that will, they aren't all the same. This is why I do it this way. I'll start with three positions, go to four, and I can see where the neck start and move. The other thing, John, too, is the, the truss rod, whether it's a T-bar or a T-bar. Oh, yeah. That has an effect because the tube is, is much more spongier. And the ebony is even worse. Yeah. Yeah. And then the different pieces mm -hmm. have a, uh, Indian rosewood or Brazilian rosewood. Yeah, all these variables. Yes, he's right. I mean, I'm I'm feeling, and thanks for bringing that up. Okay, I'm dealing with the standard mark from T bar truss rod, which is probably one of the stiffer necks. He's right. The if anybody's ever pulled bark necks, they have the ebony, 
they have a square tube, they have this one, I have seen carbon fiber, I have seen uh, actually like a V-channel used. What else have you seen? I've seen, I've seen uh, nothing. Yeah, I've seen nothing. <laughs> uh, so you're going to have to figure out what it's going to do. If a lot of times I prefer to do my compression threading on the guitar. Absolutely. I'm only doing it this way because of, I don't have a guitar ready to be compressional threaded other than a bunch of nets. So you have to be able to see what's going to happen. Now, I use a given amount of weight. I can take a look and measure what that next spring and before I fret it. So I get an idea of how much I'm going to have to bounce that neck back. How, how, do, you, how do you weight that? I'm a picture weighted. Two five pound bags of salt. There. On the shoulder of the guitar. The and you put you something put something up up here and then that's gonna that's gonna stress the neck to and it's about not just the neck. Well, we're assuming that the guitar, we're not worrying about that part of it. This has nothing to do with the neck angle. This is just like if we were adjusting the truss rod on an adjustable neck. Since we don't have that, we have to adjust it by this forceful slotting technique. Now, normally this kind of a neck, I'm looking for, like I said, about a 7,000. On ebony, I'll go as heavy as 20. How, how far do you go? I want a backbone? Yeah. Oh, it can be anything. Yeah. There, there's no set. Depends on how spongy that neck, how much that neck's going to move forward on the tension. Yeah. You, you can figure if you put weight on, and keep a note. Keep, keep notes on this stuff because you, know, you might put 10 pounds on this neck and it, and it might only go 4,000. So you know you can pretty much just straight it with that truss rod is holding it. The worst one he ever had was a 43 triple O 28 oh, ebony. Ebony with a World War II shortage? Yes, and I refretted that three times until I finally got it dialed in. That was a part of, in fact, what I ended up doing was pulling the fingerboard, routing the ebony out, because he didn't want me to take the ebony out. So I routed the ebony out, left a quarter of an inch, two carbon fiber <laughs> rods, piece of steel, and then that was it. Because that was, after the third time, I was getting Yes. Yeah. I mean, and he was right, but you know, that, that is the variable, how much that bar is going to bite. What I find, John, that I do in situations like that is I'll just refret 2 to 10. Mm -hmm. I'll pound those frets in. I won't trim them. I won't do anything to them. Get the frets in, string the guitar up, and then do all my measuring. Yeah. Did I hit it? Did I nail it? No. If there's too much forward bow, too much back bow, deal with it. Pull those frets out, put the right ones in. Once I've got the neck where I want it to be, under tension, mm -hmm. then I'll trim those ends and then do the, the first two frets and the remaining. Save me from going through all the dressing and all that process. Yeah, find I out I'm wrong. Yeah, because I'll, I'll nip them off. I, I, yeah. I agree with you. I don't bother doing the final end dressing until I'm done. Have you done any flexibility testing on the necks? Like, you know, putting a weight like on uh, the peg head? And well, I've just been doing it so long, I can put the... You kind of feel... I can push, yeah, and I already yeah. know. Because yeah. some of them are really... Sure. I, I would tell you that you can keep it... They're all different. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're all you know, different. Uh, 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 what I call a P-neck is altogether different than a V-neck. I mean, I, I yeah. think V-neck is probably one of the stiffer ones. Sure. And then you get the little profiles. Not only do they want to backbone, then like you said, they want to rotate the flex. Well, now this is where I change. I just now I can measure off of these three, and I can see if I'm starting to get number one to go back, and it hasn't moved. I'm still dead straight. So I'm going to continue working. I mean, this is just my way of doing it, so that I can identify that I am getting a backbow into my neck. So you've only done one fret in the middle, right? Uh, that's what I've done so far. Yeah, yeah, okay. So now I'm going to start coming down like he's You would be it. tempted to go another thou wider in the tang? Well, if, if I see that it's... Look, I, I've done so many of these that 20 and a half is generally my, what I call my neutral tang. And I'll work up to it by half to 27. Yeah. Uh, this is like only, if you've done that and you're seeing that it hasn't moved anything. Yeah. Uh, that might be a fairly stiff neck. You might have to push it harder, wouldn't you? Yeah. But the thing that is, on three frets aren't telling you a heck of a lot. But if I see that something's happening on three frets, I know I've got a very flexible neck, yeah. and then I'm going to work a little bit differently. 
So now I can start working this a little bit. And here, what would you would you agree with me from about nine fret up is where you want to see it start and roll, preferably yeah. at seven. Sure, right, right. You know. so, John, you uh, you see it wasn't moving, so you've got three different kinds of frets. The kind of nice tank there, you're just going with a larger tank now? I'm, well, my 23 and a half is what I'm calling my larger one. Right. Right. So now I'm going to start well, adding ready. more. Yeah. And you should start seeing something once you get three frets in a row. At that point, you definitely want to see, you expect to see something. Now, how you might want to measure that, uh, if I'm going to get really technical, I'll take it up to a granite plate and I'll use pin gauge. Uh, some guys will want to do it other ways. If you do this often enough, you can pretty much eyeball. Uh, I, you know, you've done, once you've done 10, it, you'll be able to eyeball it some school. Because you're going to actually grind everything back a little bit later. But you do want to see a certain amount of backbone. Too much backbone is going to be a problem. Not enough can also be a problem. But like Pat pointed out, the, the different truss rods will have a different effect, the different woods, the different uh, <coughs> fingerboards. Are you starting, starting with the smaller tang at the, at the, at the first fret? and? Yeah, I just put a neutral one on the first fret because that gives me a measuring point because I don't measure off the fretboard, I measure off the fret plane. If you want to use measure off the fretboard, it doesn't matter. You know, that's my technique. I just prefer to do it that way. I'm a machinist, so I like to work off of the plane. It doesn't mean, you know, that there's as many different techniques to do this as, a, as there is to bake a chocolate cake. <laughs> okay, so I'm holding this together with my thumb right now, thinking, gee, I could go for a good cup of coffee and a donut. <laughs> oh, look at that thumb. That one was flattened when I was a little kid. And you should actually be nailing on something. These are um, a good chunky, even a good chunk of, of two by four padded will work. Because the more it bounces, the less they want to see. I feel naked without my glue. Do you ever use a shot bag to? to a what? A shot bag. Uh, a shot. Yeah. yeah, shot bag to, ha to hammer on your No, brain. I have never used one to hammer on. They work really good. Well, I'm sure they would. I don't know if you get shot bags anymore or not. Oh, yeah, Cabela has them. Cabela has those uh, the siding in shot bags. They work really good. Huh? Brown yeah, You can find them almost anywhere. What okay. kind of shot bag? Uh, the, the little shooting for sighting in. Okay, now when I put my straight edge on, you might be able to hear it. Now I got a rock hole. So now I'm happy. And since 23 and a half seems to be working pretty good, I'll probably just lay another 23 and a half. And when you, like I said, I'm going for on this particular neck. I want. I would say safe. You don't want to be much more than 10. 10,000 would be a little bit too much. Five to seven would probably be perfect. And how do you know what you got? When you look at things enough, Rick Davis called it the tink test. All you got to do is tap on it. And if you hear tink, you're, you're pretty close. Now why, why would you go back to your 20 and a half tank as opposed to your 20? Well, here's what's going to happen. As this goes under stress, the barbs are going to start seeding into the end grain of the wood. Right now, the barb is actually helping to spread slot. And it probably, if you look at this under a, a microscope, you could probably see that there's still a, a slight air gap between the tang wall and the slot wall. So the barbs are actually helping to, to keep that spread apart. They aren't really seeded. They aren't. They aren't seeded. It'll take. 
I've seen them already sit for a week until they actually bottom down. What, what, what do you say there, Pat? A couple days for sure. Yeah, yeah, I like to leave it strung. Well, after a fret job, I'll leave it strung up for a couple days and then measure it. And yeah. I'll, I usually, I'll bet it held. Yeah, I usually put these on, and in fact, I have a compression fret guitar in the shop right now. I strung it up a week ago. When I go home, then I'll, I'll take it Chris, you're talking about under pressure strength. Yeah, under yeah, tension. Yeah, because what's happening, the fret board's doing this. So the slot wants to do this. So the bar is start it's still fighting that. I mean, you're intuitively guessing on how much I put in there that'll eventually where it would end up. Well, like I said before, th this is not, it's not scientific as much as it is art. How about it, Pat? Oh yeah, it's just like trying to shoot uh, a, a duck in a rocking boat. You yeah. Know? Just, you, know, you might hit it, but you probably won't hit it. Yeah. It, it, you just have to always realize that when you're gonna do one of these that you may do it two or three times. Mm -hmm. Just because you didn't nail it the first time, that's okay. That's so why I found my technique of doing it this way, I know I'm getting it to push back. Because my very first one, oh God, I probably picked the worst guitar to learn how to fret wire, to do a compression fret, because it was ebony, it was old, it was a pain. So your intuition says there was one for you Yeah, yeah. I found 23. Probably 20, so 24 down, 20 to 24 is going to be what you're going to use 99% of the time. Do you, do you ever start this with it? You've got a little bit of an upload, you don't want to take anything off the front of the table? No, I sand it, I sand it that out. What's a little more than you want to sand out? Uh, then I'll, if, if, I'll still sand it out. Okay, if you have, if you start with a forward bow, you know, the fretboard's not you don't know if the fretboard is playing the truth. Okay? You don't know did the neck work. You don't know. So most of these are what? 15, 20. Well, first off, they stopped making them in 1980. So the wood it should be reasonably stable. Now, unless you're doing your own non-adjustable, you know, you see a real heavy bow in a, in a fingerboard, something. It's a mess. I, I worked on a base that had such an incredible upload that I couldn't do that. I couldn't sand it. If I sanded it out, it would be visible. Right. Um, so. At that point, you might have to slip it or, or take it off and remove it. That's more a truss rod issue because you have an adjustable truss rod on that one. Yeah, it was gone. Yeah, it was maxed out. Well, that's, well, what I do when I'm maxed out, I usually take the barrel and I'll stick a washer on the one back in. Yeah. Gives you a little bit more bite. What kind of was it? I did. Sand. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Now, as now that I know I'm got this moving, I'm going to just fret up up to here. Now, there's another discussion as far as when you do a reset, do you want to put a wedge on? It makes the guitar playable. Yes. I mean, sometimes you look at some. You might need a sixteenth of an inch of a wedge because that looks pretty bad when you sight down a fretboard here. So you know. There's some visual effects and actual playing effects. All right, let's finish pounding these up. Now, does a bound fingerboard jack different for you? Not too much. No, no, I haven't, I haven't seen too much in that. I mean, it's most of them are bound in plastic, which is negligible, uh, and they can prove to be pain in the butt too because of just all the hammering you gotta do. Usually if I have to if I'm doing say an old T thirty five that's bound, I'll I'll take the binding down before I start hammering on it. I don't know what you do with that, but no, I'll just leave it. Yeah, put you along. With a super floppy deck, how much back though we had to go to get it straight up? Uh, the worst one was the ebony, and I think I ended up doing about a 25,000 on the back wall. And, you know, I remember stringing it up and thinking, God, the, the, the strings are all on the frets, and three days later, geez, I got a full four fret. Yeah. The ebony truss rod is, they are, if you want to learn how to do it, get an ebony one. Because you'll have to do it probably four or five times until you get it right. You can put a magnet on the back of the neck to see if you have an ebony crossbar. Yeah. That's if you I think, think that's that it might be in that World uh, World War II time period. 
when they didn't use metal. Just put a magnet on the back and see if you've got metal in there. Yeah. And like Pat spoke up earlier, the T-bar the uh, is the stiffest of them. The square tubes, they can, they're better than ebony, but not much. Yeah. When did they go from the square to 67? 67. Yeah. That was what the change was that? That was from the square. The T bar to the hollow two and then in 85, 86 they went to When you refer when you reach seven A and you have a hollow two, do you also fill it with carbon graphite? I usually do when I do a neck set. If you've got a neck that's a little on the squishy side before I consider doing depression. It depends how bad it is. I mean, I wouldn't do it to every one if I didn't have to. Yeah, just the ones that are squishy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they are. Sometimes that, that is a good point. Sometimes you have to do it. Usually on the, the 18 series or, you know, the, 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 ro I think the rosewood ones are a little bit more mushier than we have in the ones. Yeah. And I've done, you know, I guess I've evolved on that where we, in we go. Yeah. It doesn't get you too much because it's a three-eighths tube, and so what you can put in there is a quarter by quarter. Yeah. So but it's, I mean, it it's, won't hurt. No, sure. But if you throw a piece of steel in there, then it's going to weigh a lot yeah. more. Yeah. I mean, carbon fiber, the weight strength ratio is phenomenal. Have you found there's an effect on the sound of the guitar from the different kind of uh, the T-bar versus the tube? And if you start putting carbon fiber in there, are you going to change the sound of the guitar? I will be honest with you, if your ears are that good, <laughs> um, that, that, that there are so many myths about this will do that. Everything you do to a guitar will do something. But everything you do to one guitar is not going to work on another guitar. So, uh, the best thing to do is give it to a good player. Yeah, yeah. yeah but. I, I really don't think that there is a, a major tonal inference, maybe from Ebony. Ebony, I think, is a little, a little different, but, you know, it, it's, uh, if you believe it, you probably will. I, I think there's a myth surrounding the world where two Gibsons, that maybe because they had Ebony in them that they, they sound better or different or whatever. Well, you know, the, the ladies built them back then yeah. rather than the men, and I think they were probably, you know, guys, wham, bam, thank you. I think the you know, women tend to be a little bit more uh, detail-oriented. You know, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I used to supervise 13 women, and they would drive me to drink, thank you. But they were very detailed, I mean, and they remember, like my wife, they remember every word I the recording systems aren't that accurate. <laughs> Why would you say that? Oh, God. Yeah, that, I had more than one side of work in back and forth. She just heard that <laughs> Okay, now technically, I use a 23 and a half fret, fret wire on here. And you can, you can hear. Now, by going with 23 and a half, at this point, I'm probably sitting proud about 10,000. It's one way. How are you measuring it? I, I'm having trouble understanding. Well, as a machinist, I got an eye. What I'm doing is we've created an arc in this neck now. All right. This is what we call a parallel. I mean, this thing is dead nut straight. And when I put this right here as my seventh fret. I'm kind of hanging some weight down here so I can see, and you're going to have to come up and see this. Uh, you want to go up and look at it, Pat? You can raise it. Take into consideration the size of the string is 9,000. Okay, now you can see how the curve, you can see down here it's starting to come off each fret a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. And at the top fret, if you take, most business cards are somewhere between 9 to 11 thousandths. So if I put that business part in here, and it'll just about fall on So I have about 9 thousandths of a backbone. And if you measure it, I don't really worry quite too much about exactly what I got. I'm just looking for a graceful part. Uh, but if you wanted to really assign numbers to it, you could get a mathematical Plot for an arc and start plotting it out because uh, you're going to grind this all out later. 
we're going to try to make this straight when we put the actual load onto the guitar. So, any questions to this point? Do you find it helpful, given that all these necks are different, everyone reacts differently? Right. Measure the relief on a thing while it's strung up for you can touch the thing, then measure it again when it's off, just to kind of get you an idea how much that particular neck is going to change. And then you build that amount of yeah, that, into it. That, that's a, that is a good point. Uh, before you actually work with a guitar, if you manage to measure the relief of the neck under string load, take the strings off, and you've got an idea about how much that neck is moving. Right. You do and then when you got yourself good, didn't you, John? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, these have a short bed. Huh? Should I should have super glue. I should have taken super glue. <laughs> I've done that by accident. Uh, that's a good point, though. Yeah, if, if you can measure, you, you can assume what the amount of flex is going to be on the neck. Anything that's going to give you information about that neck. And the more you do it, the more experience you get at it. I mean, how long did it take you until you felt comfortable doing a... Oh, well, geez, I don't know. I'd say maybe 10 years <laughs> until I thought that it was, you know, right. What did Alan Cruz say last night downstairs? He understood why Stradivarius' best cricket or violence came out when he was 90. He finally learned something. Yeah. My first year I built 14 guitars, and I thought I learned something. At the end of five years, I figured all I did was make a lot of pretty boxes. And as you get into it more, uh, you'll know as you start progressing because you start questioning your original assumptions. Because let's face it, we've all had, until you've had a guitar blow up in your face, don't hang out your shame. I'm talking about uh, measuring non-adjustable necks. I think that it is important to measure the forward bow under tension. Yep. This is with the original frets in it. Measure that, get that measurement. Maybe it's 25 thousandths, whatever. And take all the tension off, keep the instrument right where it was, and then get that second measurement. That gives you a good idea of how much that neck moves uh, with and without tension. It's not, uh, I don't have a formula that I can tell you what to do from there, but just a good idea to know. It's experience. I mean, the more you do it, because you might have a, a neck that hardly moves at all. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've seen some very stiff, and then you had others that, my God, they're photo sticks. You know, the more you do it, keep notes. Once you can start seeing that I have a 10,000, you know, I go from 8,000 relief to a 10,000 backbone. You know, if you want to try to correlate a ratio, you can divide your relief to the final backbow, so you can kind of establish a ratio. That'll give you a baseline uh, case in point. Let's say you have a 20,000s backbow with a 4,000s relief, 4 into the 20, is you have a 1 to 5 relationship. So that'll give you an idea when you do that neck, when it moves, so you, you make a note of that. Your next one you come in and maybe it'll be a, a one to six. So you've already did a one to five. You know you need a little bit more to do a one to six ratio. I think that helps to, it's not gonna make it scientific, but it gives you a better guesstimate. Because it's all about information and you don't see these often enough. It's not a daily occurrence. But you get one of these into your shop, the beauty of it is number one financially, you know, it's an advantage, you know, and, and my, Mr. Wells is there, hello, how are you doing? Uh, you know, that's why I like, another reason why I like dovetails is financially it's great for the repair shop, but you know, I'm not, I'm not saying dovetails are better than Morris and Ted, I'm just saying they uh, allow the cash flow better. Would you agree to that? Okay. But yet, you know, it's, it's just a, you know, learn, all of the basic stuff. All of this is about, when it comes down to it, is how much you're stretching that slot. And when you look at the neck, think of it this way, it's thicker here, so it's stiffer to more flexible. And this is the area that you really want it to, to work. And before I gotta go get stitches, I'm gonna cut the rest of the sharp edge. <laughs>
You charging a premium for a compression thread job? Yes. Yep. What, yeah. kind, what kind of premium? Okay, I charge normally ten dollars a thread, fifteen pound, and I'll charge eighteen dollars for compression. Sometimes you have to do them twice. Yeah. And you're eating the second time, I guess. <laughs> business. Uh, if you want to get out of business in a hurry, it's going to business too. So, because if there's one thing you don't want to do is get what he does job. And you know, it took me ten years until I really went into business business. I mean, I did it as a hobby. And you can get away with that, but if you're going to get into it, I mean, right here. Does anybody not know Pat Burrow? Okay. <laughs> we all do. The guy that's been talking stand up, back here. Stand up and tell him who you are. Oh, well, my name's Pat Burrow. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I glue broken pieces of wood back together for a living. There you go. Uh, over here's another guy in the black shirt, the guy that tells all kinds of very oh, dark jokes. Mr. Gluck. Uh, and over here, Sylvan Wells. I mean, we all started in the beginning. I mean, nobody learned this overnight. I, I was thankful that I had some very great mentors. 2003, I came to my first symposium. I met people like Alan Peru, Pugh, Rick Davis, Sylvan. Uh, you know, I didn't get to where I was. I didn't get here by myself. You know, I didn't. I didn't come out of the womb with a guitar in my hand. I came to the first one in 93. I've, met, I've gone to every single one except the one in Missouri. That's in 93, when I first went, I had no idea what I was doing. But I knew everybody else there did know what they were doing, so I just paid attention. The, the advice is worth what you pay for. There's a lot of good forums out there. There's a lot of bad forums out there. And like I said, it, there ought to be a meter on the bottom of the CRT that the more you read, Truth meter. it'll go to green or brown. Because <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> too many forums, the amateurs are going to out-type the pros. The unofficial marketing forum comedy channel. Yeah. Oh, some of those guys have some really twisted ideas. They are. Yes, a lot of times you write and <laughs> Yeah, John. I'm for first. a new guitar maker, what would you, who, what forum would you suggest? John, if any, John won't tell you. Fred's his, his, his forum is Fred's the only one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Go to go to. Kick guitar is relatively straight. Go to Frank Ford's right. website and read everything you can read. Another thing, my two best friends are luthiers, and I know they're both better than me. I do more repair work than they do because they're builders. Let me tell you, when I have a problem, I raise my hand and go help. And I've been doing this for 45 years. My two best friends. Well, that's good. That's what people do too. Yeah, you you're here. You're going to meet a lot of people this yeah. weekend. Take advantage of it. If you run into a problem, you've met people here that can answer your questions. And I've been doing this with this organization since '89. I've never called anybody that wasn't willing to tell me something, to answer my question. And I bleed from my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and most of us will talk too long after you call. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I pass out, you know, something's going to turn it on. You want to get something done? No, just an itty bitty scratch. Yeah, but it's poor. It's crazy for the pressure. Compression. Compression, Freddy. Yeah. John, it's a loop. Grab a Freddy. Can you charge extra for the blood? That's what I want. Thank uh, you. I, that's red mahogany. Oh, band-aid. Hey, John. That would be an extra charge. You want a band-aid, John? Oh, wonderful. Sign a waiver, you. though. You can't sue them with the bandage. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's one another reason. I will agree. Super glue is one hell of a great first aid. Isn't that what it was initially designed for anyway? Yeah, yeah. It, for the Vietnam War. Uh, Sylvan and what was that? Yeah. Good first over the first Middle Atlantic open house down at your yeah. place in... Uh, 2005. That's 2005. But... Find yourself a, a good circle of friends, people who know you that give you real advice. Yeah, most areas of the country now have luthier groups. Uh, I, I live in Massachusetts, and I live in the luthier group. We've got a bunch of us here. Um, and it's, act, it's pretty active once a month or so that we try to meet with. Better, you can pick up the telephone. I've got this problem. You've seen this problem. Um, 
in Mid-Atlantic, I lived in Virginia, John and a bunch of we had a, the first meeting in Mid-Atlantic, I guess that's what they call it. Yeah, I guess that's what And that's still active as far as I know. Uh, we, we made, uh, yeah, I, I had carried my open house and yeah. uh, helped John run. We actually made a, an organization that meets in Reading bi-monthly. I know there's one in Florida because that's where I'm from. Is there one in New York? Uh, I have not started one. You'd be surprised if... Good evening, sir. Yeah, <laughs> I'll start one. <laughs> now, you know, somebody has got the forms. I, I do own the kick guitar form, but I don't run it. I actually, it's not a Blue Street guitar commercial, because if there's one thing, form will know. I, I don't care who you put on it, as long as it's good information. Because there's so much bad information out there, and people do have, some people type better than others. So, uh, Rick Davis is very active, you're active, I'm active. Uh, yeah, most, most of, especially the older guys, have been around this a while. We got a lot of help from the older guys that are now dead. So, uh, most of us feel like we got an obligation to pay it forward. You know, so, I, I don't see anybody not being willing. Very deep. You think anybody in the room will talk to them? <coughs> no, no, it's all open. There's no yeah. secrets. It's, yeah. Yeah. No secrets. Because everybody ahead of us, you know, opened up and told us, answered yeah. our questions. So it's just a yeah. continue on. You know, and, and, and to me, that's really what this organization is really all about, is keeping the information flowing. We don't want it to get a dead spot and lose everything that everybody